Well, hello there, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to part five of Dissection Amnesia The Dark Descent versus Soma. Now, in the last video, we covered a lot of the, uh, the in-depth story side of Soma, and in this part, we're going to be looking into the remainder of that while finally getting some conclusions and comparisons to Amnesia. Now, onto one of the bigger criticisms of Soma's story, and I'm not alone in this. But the black box mechanic here means we only get the last words from most of the crew, so our insight from voiceovers is primarily just people dying during the collapse. Ah oh, shit, she's fucking hurt. Her suit is leaking. We have to get her to Holocron. Shit, it's bad. Real bad. Oh fuck, no! And even for the world building stuff we get before the fall of Pathos 2 is stuff that happens after the fall of humanity due to the comet. We never get to see this station in its operational form. We never really get a clear picture of who these people were before the crisis. We don't even get faces for several of the staff members. It's not that their story isn't necessarily interesting, but we're so far removed it's hard to get invested when you get to hear how they die, but have to infer how they lived. Something that's truly lacking in Soma is humanity. Not in every sense, but basically in the sense that Aaron's signal identifies here. We don't get to see the mundanity of life on that station. We don't get to connect with any characters before the fall. Now I agree with Red Letter Media in that you should not have to consume additional media to enjoy the media you're currently with more. Regardless, I want to bring your attention to Transmission. It's a series on YouTube that was created in full reference to Soma. It depicts the survivors of the comet that hit Earth and how they carry on life in Pathos 2 during the WoW takeover. It even fills in some of the plot points and at least visually represents a lot of the characters we've only just heard about. But to get an idea of caring about people in their mundanity, check out this scene and tell me that you don't connect very much with what's happening and subsequently are more engaged with what happens next. Hey Max, what's on? All kinds of awesome shit. They sent back seeds and pipe joiners and air purifiers and whatever other boring shit and they kept all this daisy bounty over here. Seven months I've been on algae and soy and they've been sitting on this load. Wait, do you, you think it's safe to eat? I don't know man, half of it's off. The other half goes off tomorrow. But that other half does not leave this room uneaten. That much I do know. <laughs> pretty sure Reed only drinks miso out of that machine. And I'm pretty sure Golaski only drinks structure gel. Can you do that? Mm, not for long. I mean. Yeah, it's full of protein, but it's also full of, like, petroleum substrate, fuel oils. Also, I'm pretty sure it stains your teeth. <laughs> All right, people, tell me we're happy, and for God's sake, tell me Rogers can actually cook real food. I'm oh, so hungry yeah. I can eat a horse. <laughs> tell me about this whole new diet of it's yours. It's like you already uh, did. <laughs> oh, fuck it! Damn it! Oh, Richard! Medvey! Now! Fuck. This level of engagement for the surrounding characters would be pretty intense. The backstories we are given are full of description, but they are stative. And as Aaron Signal pointed out, any of the dynamic recordings are all from deaths after the fall. Few of them are development. In fact, a lot of people connect with Peter Strasky as a character. It's actually one of the people I was concerned with in terms of how he died, just because of how much I enjoyed listening to him communicate with other people. He seemed like a really upbeat guy who really just wanted to look after everybody. All right, um, calm down. It'll be okay. Can you get back to Theta? Yes. I think so. I'll head for the show of the Ox. Good luck, Amy. For you. And then you discover his fate. No fucking open! And nobody's answering to anything! What kind of cold-hearted motherfuckers would just leave us out here to die? Don't you get it? They're dead. They're all dead. Yeah. You're right. How can you be so calm about this shit? We are dying! How much air have you guys got? 20 minutes. Tops. Hey, I'm in red! Seconds away before the CO2 gets me. Strasky. Why wait, right? I'm the master of my own fate. Wait, Stress, what are you doing? <laughs> so there is clear evidence that they had ideas in this department. I would have solved this personally by having some video recordings, or maybe a few instructional videos on how best to maintain the site with a lot of examples. There was in fairness a lot of evidence that the place had been lived in, similarly to the films like Alien and Event Horizon, but we didn't get to see some real character moments for anyone aside from the two main characters, and those were few and far between, ultimately making it more difficult to be affected by them. Once again though, it wasn't the focus, and that's by design from Frictional. Their purpose was fully realized in this game, despite that I think it was a mistake not to give the characters a bit more life. It's really something to miss when you experience it in another medium and realize it's vacant from another. This asshole's getting locked into a cargo hold, and Reed's on standby to go to Upsilon in case we need power. But you'll need that suit. Which means you need to come back in one piece. 
With Holland gone, we lost any chance at triage. So really, you have no choice. Yeah. Okay, yeah, sorry. Get with Reed. And get suited up. Now, moving on to something that Soma absolutely excels at and knocks it out of the proverbial fucking park, environmental storytelling. Environmental storytelling is essentially telling the story without blatantly telling it. You have to guess at the environment and the events that took place and really discover what's happening, what happened previously and why everything came to be the way it is. There are some games that take full advantage of this and make the player feel like a fucking detective by piecing it all together. Some of the best examples on the top of my head would have to be Bioshock, Dead Space, Metroid Prime, Doom 3, Outlast, Bloodborne, and by extension, every Souls game. Oh yeah, I said Metroid, even though I shouted it earlier for having a contrived story as sequels go on and on. You can be contrived in your story, but still tell it well enough through the environment. Also, Metroid Prime and Super Metroid are literally my favorite games of all time, so don't worry about me hating them or anything. These games will show you environments with evidence of events. Combine that with the optional written and spoken evidence that you can begin to piece together with what happened here long ago as opposed to having been told in Mario or, well, a lot of Nintendo games because they want you to get the gameplay, but yeah, even like Star Wars Bounty Hunter is a very straightforward way of telling story. And it's not to say that you have to. The game is a series of white rooms. It's not telling any kind of story other than you're a lab rat, but wait, wait, what's this? Well, now, this is interesting. What kind of information can we glean from this? Compare and contrast that with Cube, a game with a similar premise but entirely different gameplay that doesn't take full advantage of environmental storytelling. But who cares? It didn't need to. I've always found that it adds an additional layer to an already hopefully flourishing story. And sometimes games really just don't need a story. So, how does Soma do in this aspect? Well, let me dissect the opening half hour or so of the game in terms of environmental storytelling. This should give you an idea of what you're going to pick up if you pay attention to everything. Bear in mind, I didn't pick up like 30% of this stuff when I first played, so don't worry about me being some kind of super detective. And for the sake of answering the question, I'm not going to be doing the, you know, environmental storytelling dissection throughout the entire game. Like, it, it, it would be ridiculous. I would end up with, like, a hundred parts. And as much as I feel there are some people who would watch all 100, I've, I, I, I think that would be a bit too much. So I'm going to take, like I said, the first 30 minutes of play. Everything up to the moment where you open the door that reveals that you're sort of underwater concretely and see just about how much information we can actually get from that. Why is there never enough time? For what? So you awake to the life of a man you are controlling, Simon. Simon's apartment gives off the impression that he doesn't much care for his health or his time in general, considering the sheer amount of fast food, dirty dishes, junk, packets, bottles and clothes and littering on the floor the movie magazine and the movie watching area taking up the majority of the space in the apartment. He clearly doesn't sleep well, we know he has nightmares and leaves his bedside lamp on when he sleeps. This could imply a fear of the dark. We know that a friend really did die and he is preparing for a funeral and that he may have spent a lot of time with her considering his collection of photos consists of nature and artistic shots of life and then one photo with her. You can find a lighter, implying that Simon smokes, which adds more credence to his lack of consideration for his health. You can find a book about being hooked in and underwater, I'm sure that carries no significance. He has several books on politics, which could imply many different things, for example his handle on what's right and what's wrong. You can find evidence that Simon likes his camera, and that his mother still cares for him. You find a prescription for Prazosin, which treats high blood pressure, anxiety and PTSD. You can find emails confirming the accident from the nightmare and the result on Simon's life as well as the cause of the accident in his desk. One thing I want to take a second to mention, though, is that Simon's laptop somehow makes the same sounds as the technology in Pathos 2 100 years in the future. Better late than never. Just an oversight, I imagine, but... Yeah, well, not a big deal. Anyway, from the room we can discern that Simon is an average schlub kind of guy, with limited activities and that he's obviously stricken by the accident and the loss of his friend Ashley, though he has managed to move on from it as evidenced by the conversation in the subway. He's still haunted by the experience and has little to really identify himself with from how he keeps his apartment. Also an interesting little note is that no matter what, the tracer fluid will pop up in one of three places. Simon's desk drawers, the bathroom cabinet, or the cupboards above the sink. The way they do it in the game is that it'll spawn in the last place you end up looking. It's almost a mini-representation of the engine showing its power to react quickly to whatever the player is doing. And that's present throughout the game. Other games do this too. Off the top of my head, I think Layers of Fear is probably the best representation of a game changing dynamically based on the player's perspective.
As you approach the pace office, there are a few things to notice. Everything in the office is slapdash, they barely have security set up, and the emails will tell you that apparently they are essentially renting out the area, and that they will be pretty much rushing things, and that they desperately needed a brain-damaged person to come in. You can read about the intention of the two men here, one being a computer science major and the other being a neuroscience major. They are trying to develop a technology that will take a scan of a person's brain and bombard that scan with stimulants, including stuff like running a marathon while downing pain pills all the way to not doing anything at all. It can do it fast and efficiently, and hopefully it'll find the answer to what could actually fix the broken code that's represented by the brain scan. Then it'll translate that answer into a real-life method to get someone onto the path to health. You can see that David and Paul scanned each other as practice, and they are currently sponsored by a company named Hamatsu. As you move through the area, you can spot a few images that I imagine have some meaning meant by the developers, but besides that, you can see a lot of statistical data in a room where there's a lot of tools and technology on the floor being worked on. There are some computer screens flashing a hell of a lot of code, and above them is several images of the brain. Kind of a neat representation of what the whole game is about. You then talk to Munchie, and he confirms the details of everything you learned just outside while trying to reassure you of the process. This is the method right through the game. You're given the information in the environment, and then you're giving it directly in case you didn't catch it. And so the scan begins. Upon waking, the first thing you notice is the faint red light just out of view in front of you. Once you flip it, you get the lights in the room, and you're clearly not in the scan room anymore. This place is cold, metallic, and rough. This room, and by extension the facility you're in, is abandoned, or seemingly anyway. There's blood on the floor and what looks to be leading up to your chair. Blood that seems to originate from the near wall vent. Also that there are growths in the room's walls and a damaged robotic thing on the floor. A monitor next to your seat tells you it must be activated from the service console, and the service console cannot be activated without an Omni tool. So we have a goal. Noteworthy is that there are six suit spaces on the wall, and two are missing. A vent cover that's been knocked from the wall thanks to the strange growth, and finally a glass pane that's cracked. I think you know what to do when you put these pieces of information all together. So the first thing you should notice is that a lot of pathways and doors are sealed off, with what resemble car wheel clamps and chains with padlocks. There's a restroom with a smashed mirror, a break room with strong evidence that it was looted for every last piece of food, and a growth similar to the one in the starting room. Soon after or before this, you can find what's labelled as a data buffer that plays a recording of a man and woman apparently sealing off the area to prevent them from getting in, and that the locks are described as permalocks. It ends with the two people mentioning that they're heading to the communication centre. With no other choice, you break the permalock on another door and explore a bit. There are four robotic-looking things in a room, and one of them acts very strangely if you get close to it. Touch the third robot in the room, you get another recording of a woman asking if the robot is able to talk like the others. Sort of implying a level of sentience. Suddenly, as you move away, the second robot, the one with the janky response to you getting near it, has blundered off and broken through the sealed door. It leaves behind a trail of black goo. If you follow it, it leads to a vent shaft that it has crawled into. The shaft itself is overgrown with the growth from the other rooms, and you can't follow it. Not that you'd want to. Moving on, you find a door with another lock on it, and as you get closer, you can hear screaming and banging from the other side. Once it's calmed down and you can enter the room, you can see the black goo as a trail leading from the vent shaft in the room itself to the body crushed up against the wall, and more of the growth. And here it looks far more like flesh, and there's black goo all around. It is in this room that you can find the Omni Tool, and that it's on a table surrounded by tools and notes relating to it. Knowing that it's precisely what you needed to get into the service console, naturally you return to the beginning room, and on your way there are strong signs that something is still here. On further inspection, the chain gates that were previously up are now down, and upon even further inspection you spot something quite chilling. Once you install what is needed, you can see in the terminal that you are using that there's evidence of something called the WoW having attempted accessing Site Upsilon twice. Upon looking at the walls earlier, we could see that we were in something called Upsilon that's a part of something called Pathos 2. Apparently the WoW was denied, and then it accessed something called Legacy in a subfolder of Simon Jarrett, you and the author David Munchie. What is accessed is referred to as a terminal scan that originated from Toronto, and that it is complete. There is also information about the six suits in the room. Suits 5 and 6 are in use. We found one earlier, but where is the second? All that's really left is updating the tooltip and moving on. Now, I'd go further, but I think I would like to complete this video within the next 10 years. So from that, we can glean that you've woken up in a facility run by people that has befallen some sort of tragedy. A tragedy that has resulted in the death of certain people and needs to be shored up for security. From what we can assume are sentient robots. Robots that are now bigger than previously anticipated and that at the very least are more vicious. You are more than likely the scan of yourself from Toronto in some kind of machine that was dragged onto the pilot's seat from a nearby vent, as well as considering that machines with some kind of sentience is more than confirmed in the second locker room. And your Omni tool shows clear evidence of something using that scan, why you've been brought here and by whom is yet to be known. Where you are and what happened to everybody is to be uncovered through equally as effective environmental storytelling throughout the game. It is fantastic. 
Honestly, some of the best I've ever seen. Everything is on a platter for you throughout the game. The game wants you to care. Frictional were banking on players getting thoroughly invested in this aspect of the game, so they did away with the inventory and other more game-like features that were present in Amnesia. Was that a good decision? Well, the next section will be all about that, so don't worry. Regardless, fucking fantastic work done here to keep you invested in what's happening by drip-feeding you information and maintaining what feels like a living, breathing world that has been consumed by tragic events but by no measure means there are none left to befall you. The pacing and setup of this whole sequence is fantastic, and it really felt like it was reinvigorating the genre, but this sort of design does not appeal to many. Honestly though, I hope this assessment of the information in the opening half hour of the game lets you know how much work was put into the environment, and perhaps people can start realizing that the fact that you're a robot is not a big twist. Most people guess it before the reveal, anyway. Seriously though, the environment is telling you things in this game. Pay attention. <laughs> Man, every mirror that we've seen is broken. I mean, I don't expect everything to be in great shape. But that can't be a coincidence. Okay, for the interest of exploring what is very much considered a literal integral part of the story, let's take a quick look at the WoW. Heh, <laughs> quick look. The WoW, originally intended for maintenance and life support in Pathos 2, took time to redefine its approach as Warden of Pathos 2. Basically, it decided that the best way to sustain life, considering what happened with the comet, is to make certain that life in Pathos 2 would never stay dead. It's been taking over the helpers. Not really, no. It doesn't take anything over. It doesn't think. It can't. It's a series of threshold logic gates. Complex? Yeah, but nothing like intelligence. It takes over the helpers. It uses them to build things. It used them to build that thing out of a busted Lumar and helper parts. It's planning something. The WoW is using- No, Imogen, the WoW isn't. The WoW isn't planning anything. It can't be novel. What it's doing, we do. At best, the WoW is re-implementing our own work, and it's doing so in accordance with its most basic operational premise. Which is what? To preserve life. Yeah. The WoW then took the task of preserving life at all costs. Now what it defines as life is another story. The WoW doesn't know how to distinguish what is human and what is not. Life inevitably falls apart, and the WoW-controlled structure gel can put people in a sort of metamorphosis of many different states. Some are reanimated entirely, and some end up fused with the gel in the flesh of the pipes and the walls. The interesting thing here is that we know the WoW doesn't let people infused with it die. They stay in this vegetative state indefinitely unless the power to them is removed. Now the girl we talked to who was uploaded in this machine believes she's on the Ark. We know she's fully infected by the WoW, but she's most certainly not on the Ark. Why is that? Think back to the point in the game where you yourself are put into the gel and the growths on the wall. You become safe at home with Ashley. You are with her. You're a couple. But it doesn't last as you wake and remove yourself from the situation. Is it possible that in order to sustain life, the WoW has many different ways of doing so? Is it possible that the WoW doesn't want people to fight, and so it puts them in a mental state in which they can be happy? The reason Simon doesn't stay in that dream is that it doesn't feel right. He knows that Ashley wasn't interested in him in that way, he has nightmares about it. Regardless, what is Structure Gel? I found something in 12Q. Yeah? It was Structure Gel. It hardens in atmosphere. Yeah? It's like a scab. Builds had ruptured and it scabbed over with the stuff. That's that's intentional. Yeah. It slipped in a puddle of the stuff. It's slick as hell. Yeah, it's a lubricant. A lubricant, I know, and a conductor and a signal medium and a highly protonated monosubstrate polysaturate. I'm an engineer for Christ's sake. I just think it's weird to see the wall scab up. You don't think that's weird? Well, the important thing to know about structure gel is that it can bind and power robotics and it spreads bloody fast. Shit. 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 So the WoW now has its new mission. How will it accomplish this? Well, firstly, take scans of the entire crew available and begin putting them in machines because that makes more humans, right? Well, the WoW thinks so. What if a person dies? Well, the WoW can simply hook them up with structured gel and reanimate their corpse. Christ. Jessica? Jess? Jess? In fact, why not speed up the whole process since they'll be happier and they'll be stationary and safe? At this point, the WoW just needs to spread and keep pumping out more and more human scans until humanity is... saved. Once the humans of Pathos 2 become aware of all of this, they enact plans to stop the WoW, and it doesn't end well. In the transmission series, it ends with Imogen Reed shutting the WoW's main power source down. Unfortunately, she didn't prevent the backup power. 
Using this limited power source, the WoW orchestrated the creation of Simon II using the body of the woman who tried to destroy it. But I'm getting ahead of myself. During the events of Soma, you find out that Johann Ross, the resident AI psychologist, recognizes early on that the WoW has taken a turn for the worse. The WoW is reaching out to every machine, every life form, to manipulate, to control. It's trying to help save its creators from all this, just like the protocol demands. But really, what is good enough? Where is the line drawn for what is human and what is not? Would walking corpses do? Would a group of machines thinking they're human be acceptable? We can't trust a machine to know, to understand what it means to be. We have to terminate the WoW project. It can be done. I just need to get some help from Omicron. So he attempts to make his way to destroy the WoW and share his plans with a woman, Herber, who tries to gather some information on the destruction of the WoW. She got very close to enacting her plan, but the WoW shrieked, as Ross described it, and killed everybody in Omicron. Obviously it doesn't matter too much to the WoW, because they'll be alive soon enough once the WoW infects the entire place. The WoW cannot use black box destruction on Simon because he doesn't have a black box. I think it's fair to say that the creatures in the world want Simon dead, but as for whether or not the WoW was compelling them in any such way is up for discussion. Ultimately, the information I'm sharing with you right now is simply what I concluded after way too much research. Regardless, the very gel Ross wanted to use to destroy the WoW ends up being used in the power suit, and you get presented with an offer to poison the WoW itself. Now we come to a point of contention with certain players. On the way to the final area to conclude the Simon story, a new character literally appears from nowhere It pops his head around the door and says, Sorry to interrupt, player, but before you tie up the main plot, could we borrow you for five minutes to tie up the shitty monster plot as well? So you follow him into a little room, press one button labelled Resolve Shitty Monster Plot, and then get on with what you were doing. I'm only slightly exaggerating. Oh, I agreed with this perspective wholeheartedly when I completed the game for the first time. What a stupid little side thing that ends up really abruptly. And the guy's eaten. What the fuck? That doesn't make any sense. How contrived. Upon playing it again and paying just a little bit more attention, I realized how much of a dumbass I and Yahtzee kind of were being. Ross is introduced in Omicron. That's where his corpse was reanimated, and that's where the poison gel is stored. Ross's motivation can be found in Phi, and finally the decision is binary. You don't have to resolve the shitty monster plot if you don't want to. So why do I really like how they handled this? Well, it's established a while back that the WoW is stored in Alpha and Ross beckons you from Omicron until you finally reach Alpha. The reason he hasn't been annoying you up to this point is because he didn't actually see it as a feasible option. But it's all there, in your face. Sure, it's hard to make sense of it, but now that I have just explained how the WoW works throughout this video, maybe you guys get it too. Ross wanted to remove the WoW from the station because it was creating abominations and thinking they were human. The WoW wants to kill anything that prevents it from creating more life, and you were left with a choice that Markiplier also has to deal with. Hand into the things. Do it. Oh, why? Why? Wait, I, I'm just, like, hang on a sec here. I, I, I want to know my options. I want to weigh everything. What's what's the reason for it? Why am I do the thing? What is the gooby goo? Can I just go out? Would I want to go out? It Hope seemed... That the world continue producing its filth. Kill it. Take it easy. Yeah, I gotta think about this. Because, I mean, admittedly, it doesn't seem like the WoW is doing very good, but who am I to say... Force your arm inside it. Well, okay? Yeah, hey! Just don't tell me to shove my arm into anything I don't want to do! See, I really gotta- I really gotta think this out, like... What are the options of- I'm just literally just being told what to do. Please, Simon. I mean, this is literally a choice here. I could leave. I could literally just leave. Right now. Couldn't I? So there you have it, the choice is to poison the WoW and destroy it along with all its creatures, or allow it to continue to potentially take over the Earth with what is arguably abominations. The Earth is a barren wasteland now, so what harm does it really do? Alright, here's my reasoning behind- I've made my decision, here's my reasoning behind it. I don't know who this guy is, I don't know why he's telling me to do this, I don't know what this has to do with anything. Like, this is totally off the beaten path from what I was originally here to do, how do I know I can try? I'm not one to follow the instructions of someone who's screaming at me to do something. So... I've made my own choices up until this point, so here we go. I don't know if it's right. Hey, Simon. Humanity will suffer for an eternity. Okay. Honestly, this is a pretty interesting choice to consider. Basically, leave what life there is to exist in what appears to be some form of happiness or erase it forever. I will continue this later on, but the last thing here is that Ross gets eaten by a big wow snake thing, which seems convenient, but hey, 
It's controlled by the WoW, right? The fish are very low-level species. Ross is actively trying to destroy the WoW. Maybe that's why Ross was jumping all over the place, and when he moves to potentially use you is when he's stationary long enough for POW. It's really up to you guys, but I think it makes enough sense. It's also a pretty neat choice to have to make, to be honest. So aside from all that, it would seem the creatures are results of the WoW, trying to create and sustain life. Simon is referred to as a sound body and a sound mind, which is very rare on Pathos 2. And unfortunately, the WoW cannot decide the difference between something like Simon, a human, and a creature spawned from the WoW itself. Something that is noteworthy is that Simon can't see things that'll worry him, how he perceives life is clouded by some sort of safeguard. He doesn't see his body for what it is at first, he also doesn't sound like anything but human to himself. Once this is lifted, he spends the entire game ignoring the bombardment of information that tells him we will not be guaranteed to go to the Ark. In fact, it's a guarantee that Simon 3 will not be going to the Ark at all. Simon doesn't deal well with this and spends the entire game thinking he's the original Simon, no matter what, despite obvious knowledge that the first Simon is long dead. It's almost like he doesn't understand information that could hurt him. What is this, Bernard? Doesn't look like anything to me. I cannot see the things that will hurt them. I've spared them that. Their lives are blissful. In a way, their existence is purer than ours, freed of the burden of self-doubt. Perhaps this is the WoW's doing. Perhaps it's in relation to the fact that Simon is referred to as a basic legacy scan. It's interesting regardless, and there's a lot of similarities to Soma's messages in Westworld. Okay, so some last things about Soma's storyline. There's a glitch screen that spams characters, but if you slow it down, you can pick out words in the mess. If you guys want to check out those words and see if you can find some meaning, I implore you to do so. When you try and play chess in Delta, the computer refers to your opponent, presumably the WoW, as corrupted. Soma is fairly by the numbers as a horror game. You're presented with a mystery and you go forth. Danger is required and so it shall be here. This time it's in the form of corrupted man-things mixed with an underwater infection and an AI that's figured out, like all AIs are wont to do, that humans shouldn't be at the top of the food chain. They should be somewhere right around Shark Chum. Also, there's some bits about what year it may be or may not be and how you came to be there, but to stay out of spoiler territory, I can just say for the most part, it's handled with all the dexterity of smashing your thumb with a hammer. I have so many questions! What in the hell are you talking about? You just said that I shouldn't be here- oh, Stop, Jesus Christ, man. Okay, let's unpack all that shit for a second here. Jesus, I'm so tired of reviewers who speak relatively fast so you don't have to, you know, go to the trouble of actually listening to the retarded points they're making. He said that Soma is by the numbers, which would be funny if he was aware that it's Frictional who popularized those numbers, but they changed plenty in the gameplay from their previous titles, which focused heavily on other aspects. Some that I've been over in this fucking epic. Regardless, he also said the AI behaves like any psycho AI does and considers humans on the bottom of the food chain. Like, I went over not ten minutes ago that that's not true at all. The WoW wants to preserve life more than anything, and he said that the story was as subtle as a hammer to the thumb. Interesting, since this is the same guy who said this. To be honest, I was just really surprised about how rote and basic that the story was, and its beats are so predictable that it absolutely offers nothing of interest after a couple hours in. Look, okay, I don't even know what you thought the story even was, nor do I think you recognize what subtlety is. Either way, you managed to miss key motivations for main and tertiary characters, you missed apparently all the subtle elements of storytelling, you, you took your experience of muted gameplay and story and described it as straightforward and blunt storytelling on Frictional's part? I simply think that you're not their audience. They require patience, attention, and genuine honesty from their players. And it's sad that you're telling people that this is what the game is to your audience of... Wh what? Well, rest in peace, YouTube. You were so young. Seriously, though, look at mine compared. It's an embarrassment. Maybe what I'm saying is wrong. No, if you needed evidence for the storytelling, environmental storytelling, and character motivation, just literally rewatch this part and the part before it, you should be fine. For the most part, you never feel any real threat after the initial Keanu Reeves. Whoa, these guys are like starfish and dudes that had a baby. Listen, folks, this is the last frontier, a deep, dark place where mankind since ancient times felt Leviathans rested. That has awesome locations like the Mariana Trench, Stygian Abyss, and my favorite, Challenger Deep. And yet all this mystery and cool names and awesome locations does nothing. The game simply isn't scary. Seriously, though, these people on YouTube just run their mouth. How about you redraft your script? Maybe play the 
the game even once, because I'm not convinced you did that. Look into other people's experience and see what you miss. The game simply isn't scary. Wrong. Yeah. Fuck off, ACG. You're as bad as Joseph. Ugh. Regardless, Frictional did a fantastic job with the story in Soma, and its delivery was beautiful. It functions as a vehicle for the questions asked and the reality they wanted to convey in this horrifying science fiction world. Their focus was on immersion and the belief that if they could strike the balance of combining some old science fiction ideas with some new science fiction storytelling, then they could make something great. The sad thing is a lot of players missed this mark. I'll be honest with you guys, out of all the reviews I saw, I was lucky to not be disappointed in that Super Bunny Hop, Errant Signal, and Zero Punctuation, as well as a few others, despite commenting on a few misguided things on certain subjects, certainly saw the intention of the game, and I will show you that as we approach the future sections. But a depressing amount of respected critics on YouTube missed the mark entirely. They had their expectations completely coloured and ruined before they even approached playing the game. There will be people who go into horror games with the specific intent to not be scared, because they want to prove to themselves or the world that they aren't creeped out, or are so rational or brave that the silly game and its silly scares don't work on them. Or, far more favorably, they simply don't enjoy being scared, and separate themselves so much that they don't engage with the game on that level and play it for the story or something instead. Can you spell projection? They weren't ready for what Frictional was providing here. They expected something and got something else, and because they lost what they wanted, they treated it as a failure. Frictional was trying to make Soma a scary, tense experience, and they failed. While after months of research, I found that Frictional aced their intentions at the cost of losing a large amount of the appreciation from the fanbase they had created with Amnesia, which I will again explain a little bit more later. Ultimately, though, no one holds these people to any kind of standard. And why should they? This is a hobby, and they can do with it as they will. But Mauler, why do you reference Joseph Anderson so much more than the other guys? Oh, that's easy. Most of the reviewers that get it wrong throw in that it's their perspective, they treat the whole thing like it may not be the case for everybody, which is what any decent reviewer should do with anything that's remotely subjective. I understand the aspect, though, you have innumerable amounts of evidence that point to a particular thing. Like, you know, I'm, I'm not going to accept the fact that anyone says that the environmental storytelling in this game is bad. It would just be like, what the hell are you talking about? That's wrong. It's, it is good. It is a fact that it is good in this game. It's not an opinion, it's a fact. But you've really got to be careful with the language you use. I mean, I've only rescripted my work three times for this project because, I mean, when you have 60k words to work with and you have to rescript that, yeah, it takes a long time. So I'm going to have mistakes in here, and like I did with my previous dissection, I want comments in the comments section to tell me where they think I fucked up so I can have discussions with people. It's kind of the greatest thing ever. I'm not going to not reply to someone who's got a good point if it's negative. That's, that's just not how I do it. Joseph doesn't do that. He paints every last word that slithers out of his mouth as gospel. He structures his channel and subsequently his videos around the idea that he spotted something that others didn't. He's a contrarian. His popularity with viewers is based on being contrarian. Who in their right mind would ever say that Soma isn't a horror game? What wonderful retardation is that anyway? How do you get to define something genre? I may think it's dreadful, but Five Nights at Freddy's is still a horror game. I'm not taking taking away from that game just because it's terrible. Yet he says it was such gusto in a sense of, hey man, you probably didn't realize this, but because I played the game once and wasn't spooked, it turns out it wasn't a fucking horror game. It's such a boring approach to analysis, not to mention the blatant lies he spouts. I'll have more examples as my video goes on, but he fabricates scenarios in games and lies about the assets to fit his conclusions. He said that there's only the hide-and-seek method and the enemies are the same, despite Frictional having several different enemy interactions, differing to the point of having one that you're welcome to stare at and move around, but can't create too much sound. This is a similar mechanic to The Witch in Left 4 Dead. It's something you have to do in order to progress in the game. But nah, don't mention it, Joseph, because it'll ruin your fucking narrative. He says none of the monsters look scary in the game and references the Construct, the goofy looking enemy from the beginning, but doesn't let us look at the proxy, the flesher, or fucking acres. Look at this fuck, how is it not scary? So yeah, fills this video with obvious lies to make his contrarian perspective a little bit more believable. I mean, I've shown you two, but there's like a metric fuck ton and we'll get through them. Aside from that, he doesn't reference what he thinks is scary, so you're left sitting there wondering just what the hell he even believes is scary. It's a solid part of the deception because it puts viewers in a position where they can't critique him and his choices. Though I can, because like I said on my very harsh comment on his channel, unfortunately for you, I played the fucking game, so I know what you're lying about. Look, I'm sure the dude is great to get along with or whatever. I just wish he would derive some actual talent and effort from himself to make this analysis video. Nobody's gonna call him on his shit, so leave it to me, I guess. 
Hopefully that makes this a little less hard to understand. I mean, if this isn't already obvious, I'm a huge frictional fan, but that doesn't alter the fact that I will make only declarative statements about subjects I have evidence for, not just fucking feelings, Joseph. P.S. Stop lying, you faggot. Now, how about we do something fucking wonderful? We've just torn down someone who is known for his intellectual critiques. Let's look at someone who's known for being an idiot professionally and really only experiences games on a level of fun and goofiness. Explain something about Soma's story. All that, like, the whole thing of the game, and I was starting to- This is why I was getting anxious up to the point, because I- 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 I, I feel like some people wouldn't understand the futility of it is actually the story. Like, 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 some people might say that this game ends with, like, it didn't matter what I did, but it did matter what you did, you just didn't feel the end result of what it mattered, and that's the point it's trying to make. Like, it, it, like, I love this game. I'm gonna say it right out. I love it. It's amazing. This was awesome. I loved everything about it. This game was- kept me engrossed. The philosophy of it, the scares of it, like, it was- it was such a cool game, such a well-made game, such a well-made idea, and yet, I, I fear that it will go over a lot of people's heads if they don't really wrap their head around the subject. Oh, there it is. Yeah, we've tried to go a bit deeper with it this time. Uh, in particular, the, the major differences we're trying to make from Amnesia um, are we, we've kind of done horror. Yeah, we've done horror. We've done scary environments, and we still have scary environments on this. Um, and, and we've done being chased by monsters, and we still have being chased by monsters in this. But what we're really trying to get out in terms of horror uh, is leaving you with a bunch of questions so that it's not the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay that's, that's the really scary thing. The really, really scary, and that will be scary, but the yeah. really, really scary thing are the questions that it leaves in your head once you've put the controller down and walked away. And that, that's what we're trying to do. So all of these little sub-stories we're building across the, the, the base are to try and reinforce those themes, which are... So very suspenseful, very psychological. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what we're trying to ask some questions about are... Uh, it, it's, it's about identity uh, and what... what it, Kind of really what it means to be human and then what was players reaction they were all over the place there were players who thought, felt like the game where is the twist coming there's no twist in the game this sucks you know i, I know what's going to happen um and from players that were caught completely off guard by these things and i mean the whole shit I, i'm gonna try and not get into this but <laughs> the, the whole coin flip thing is very interesting but it, it depends a lot on how you view certain things if it's real and some people are like very, you know, or 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 what are you gonna call non-coiners? <laughs> In conclusion, there's a lot to say about these stories when they're put side by side. There is a speech done by Thomas Grip, the lead designer for Frictional Games, about how story and gameplay work together in video games, and as a whole, he describes the gameplay process as one, mechanics, the literal things you're able to do, two, dynamics, the things the mechanics can do when used in conjunction with each other, and three, aesthetics, how one dresses these mechanics to prevent players from looking at them as mechanics. He then goes on to say the story works with the gameplay in that 1. Missing scene, the objects and locations are in the game to assist with the mechanics. 2. Drama, the reason the event is happening in the moment, like Mario jumping over a cannonball, with a combination of mechanics being jumping and moving. And 3. Narrative, which builds the reason for it all happening in the first place, for example Bowser stealing Princess Peach. Now this set of rules essentially applies to all games, and how well it's constructed is incredibly important. That when you, you, you think about this is basically this here, is what you want the player to uh, to to uh, what it, what the player should be seeing as they're doing their stuff. And in in a game like Tetris, this doesn't really matter because it doesn't matter um, if if the Tetris blocks are like is it is it crystals, is it stone? It doesn't really matter that much to that game because these two like they're they're very very similar. You you can you can you can play Tetris in a very abstract way. Mario loses a lot of the appeal if you remove this you could you could just have you know squares and bo uh, squares and circles and stuff like that in in a mario game which is this this space i'm gonna i'm gonna say space from now on so we know and the system space so you, you can play mario in the system space but in the story space it's uh, it's harder and 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 the same goes for for other uh, more for other games like an adventure game would be very hard to play in system space because you wouldn't know what, what the hell any object would be it's it's very very important that you uh, that you know what the object is 
Basically, with this in mind, Friction will focus on creating worlds that telegraph pretty much everything from mechanics to the world's narrative, and they are incredibly successful in this regard. I think that both games are exceptional in this task, however, there's so much more attention in Soma and so much more use of the space they have. I think it's a matter of the company moving forward, that they've gotten better at it, but it doesn't change the outcome of the analysis. Remember that stories are told through gameplay. So, for instance, I, my belief in what I feel like are stories is that Super Mario has lots of stories. In Super Mario 3, when I go after one of Bowser's kids, I jump on the airship, I dodge the cannonballs, and then I go until the final fight, and, you know, I... In the last moment, when I'm the small Mario, I managed to whatever figure out his pattern and beat him. Um, that's a narrative. That's a story. Now, this is not you know you wouldn't write a book about that. Perhaps that it wouldn't be like the best of books um, um, or sort of narratives. There's other good stuff, but that's that's sort of where you want to put your focus on. You wanna you wanna you want to bring forth these sort of player experience. And I mean, no one says that, you know, you know, the, 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 Mario is so pushy in its narrative. I didn't want to kill Bowser's kids, you know, but, but uh, you know, because it just comes naturally, how you play. And that's actually the same thing you want to do with the story. You don't want to like push the player into going somewhere. You want to make sure that the gameplay urges them to go somewhere to experience something and to have a certain um to have certain feelings in certain places i feel like a bad man a big difference between these two is that in telling the story you are creating it in soma as you walk while in amnesia you're trying to figure out what it was you can make your final decision in the end game this makes for an interesting attachment difference players will subjectively prefer taking the reins versus playing the detective Ultimately, though, this comes from the 10-year-long Frictional blog, like a lot of the sources in my critique. Seriously, that blog is huge. Frictional specialize in fragmented storytelling. This means giving little details all over the game in terms of story and character development that culminates in a bigger realization about characters and story while also having a realization about the purpose of the game itself. This style is something I personally love the shit out of in terms of delivering a story, not to say that I can't enjoy other styles. Straightforward stuff is often entertaining too. Regardless, I think this style is a solid reason for why the games from Frictional end up the way that they do and it matches the two biggest realizations of the games. What is the line between right and wrong, and what makes us human? The games almost sleeper hit you with these, and a lot of their questions are thanks to the fragmented storytelling, and it makes them that much more effective. Hit the switch if you want to drain his battery. Oh, God, don't make me do this. I'd rather not stay plugged in any longer. Oh, this is, this is. So when it comes to putting these stories side by side, you could probably tell that there is a little more to say about Soma. According to my notes, there's approximately eight times more. Sorry about that. But yeah, Soma is chock full of really interesting stories that all bind together to tell a tale in a distant yet believable world with the intention of bringing some very important attention to philosophy and existential dread. Amnesia is a small tale about a man trying to stay alive in his descent into immorality to prevent that outcome. Honestly, these stories match the games perfectly. There's no clear amount of this should have been this way or these should have been here instead in the stories. Amnesia focuses on its gameplay, and the focus lets them tap into the horror of losing your own life. The more basic and understood fear. The elements in relation to torture and terror all assist that backbone fear of simply wanting to continue existing, and that reflects in Daniel's story. He simply doesn't want to die, and that's his motivation in the game as well as the players. Soma is using every element to lead you to question what defines life and humanity. Simon is convinced throughout the game that he's essentially human, even when he knows that he's a machine that the Ark will allow him to return to a stricter understanding of his humanity, that what he is now is simply a stepping stone and that he deserves to be on the Ark because he is the real Simon. But what is the real Simon? There's a fantastic movie called The Prestige in which, spoilers, a character is using a machine to teleport in aid of a magic act, but it leaves behind a copy of a person it uses. Now whether or not the person who moves away is the copy or the person who stays on the platform is the copy is never actually confirmed, and of course the character himself doesn't know because the copy is perfect. It took courage to climb into that machine every, every night, not knowing if I'd be the man in the box. Or in the prestige. In his first attempt, he kills the perceived copy, and moments before its death, it claims to be real. No! 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 Wait! I'm not. Basically, the question and answer about what makes us human becomes... You want to ask, so ask. Are you real? Well, if you can't tell, does it matter? 
Soma beats out Amnesia by a country mile for the subjects it raises and the investment you will have in its philosophy. But honestly, like I said in the beginning, we knew this was going to be the answer. The question is after every segment which game in all of its collective parts is superior, though it's clear Soma takes the cake here. This conclusion is punctuated by the fact that most people, even if they hated Soma, would admit that the story was better than Amnesia. But most of the time it's because they're thinking about how great the actual gameplay was. Alright, so there it is. We have completed the story part. It only took like five minutes or whatever, so, you know, let's just move on to the next part, which is going to be gameplay. We're going to look into Amnesia and Soma's gameplay, compare them, and really understand why certain decisions were made. Though I can say that that's not going to be in this video. I'll see you next time, folks. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.